Well, hey, good morning, Rescue Church. I want to say welcome to each and every one of you in all of our locations. If you're new to the Rescue Church, you need to know something about us. We are one church spread out in multiple locations. And so this morning, I just want to say good morning, not only to those of you gathered here in Flandreau today, but also to our Coleman campus, Garrettson, Deeside, Jamaica, Peoria, Illinois, all of you watching online on the iCampus right now. Thank you for being with us. It's great to have you here today. Hey, I want to tell you something that I particularly love about the Rescue Church, one of my favorite things about this church. And, and maybe this is too bold of a statement, and I'm completely biased in saying it. I understand that because I'm the pastor and whatever. But can I just tell you that one of the things I love about the Rescue Church is that I think we are a friendly church. I really do believe that. I, we don't always get it right. You know, we've made some mistakes. Not all of you are friendly. Um, but for the most part, in this church, we have kind of adopted a culture that is accepting and welcoming to those who come in that, that are from the outside. And, and when people come, my full expectation, by the way, that this is my expectation of our church, is that we receive anybody who walks through the doors of our church with open arms and a handshake, like literally a physical handshake, like we are glad to have you with us today. And, and I believe for the most part, we do a pretty good job of that. So to all of you in the Rescue Church, thank you for making this church a place that is welcoming to others. Here's what I know, is that if, if I had a friend that I invited to church, I'm just gonna make up a name, because I don't have many friends, so I'll just call him Joe, okay? He's my imaginary friend. What I know is this, I could invite Joe to come to any weekend service of the Rescue Church in any of our locations, here's what I believe. I genuinely believe that Joe would be warmly welcomed into our fellowship, regardless of which campus Joe stepped foot into. Like, I wouldn't even have to be with him to tell everybody, hey, this is my friend Joe. I have that level of confidence in my church family that if Joe showed up at any one of our locations, there would be people approaching Joe, extending a hand physically to say, hey, Joe, Welcome. It's great to have you with us at the Rescue Church. We're so glad you're here. Okay, let's just pretend, though, that now I'm with Joe, and I'm introducing Joe to my friendly church family, and I tell you, oh, by the way, my friend Joe, um, he has the flu right now, and pink eye, and ringworm, and bronchitis. Now let me ask, how friendly of a church are we to someone with pink eye, ringworm, the flu, and bronchitis? We're probably like, hey, welcome, Joe. It's great to have you. You can sit over there. I'm going to be with my family over here, right? And I can't say that I would blame you for feeling that way. Who wants to give someone that's that contagious and unhealthy a big old hug or a handshake? Like, even if we do, we're probably putting on the hand sanitizer, right? Because we don't want to catch whatever Joe's got, Here's the point that I want to make, is that we naturally avoid sick people. It's just the truth. We naturally tend to shy away from and avoid unhealthy sick people when, when it comes to physical sickness and contagious diseases especially. And on the flip side, I just heard this analogy this past week. It was so good. On the flip side, the opposite is also true. We are drawn to people who have physically healthy bodies. Let me give you a for instance, in case you're missing what I'm saying. I'm not talking about the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. I'm talking about the fact that we will line up and pay money and watch on TV to see some of the most fit athletes perform whatever their sport is, whether it's Olympics, whether it's the NFL. Like We love to come and watch people perform at a high physical level. Because we love to watch them do things physically that you and I probably can't do physically with our bodies. We are drawn to healthy people. We're attracted to them. There's something attractive about healthy people. And there's something very unattractive about sick people. And you're like, John, what is this? A class in diseases and stuff and the need to wash our hands? No, that's not where I'm going with this. I want to tell you that the same is true when it comes to emotionally healthy or unhealthy people. Today we are finishing up a series called Emotional IQ where I've been trying to encourage God's people with this, this idea that if you're spiritually mature, along with that you need to be emotionally healthy. You need to have a high emotional IQ and emotional self-awareness to understand how you're doing in this area of your health. And, and I believe with all my heart that where there is someone who is emotionally unhealthy and they're emotionally sick, 
we tend to avoid those kinds of people. We don't want those kinds of people in our lives. We are drawn to and attracted to people who are emotionally healthy. It's just how it works. And today, I want to make the point that I believe God is calling all of those of us who believe in the name of Jesus, therefore, those of us who are the children of God, I believe God is going to say over our lives that his will for us is that we would live such emotionally healthy lives that our relationships would be so solid and so healthy that others would be drawn to us, that our lives would attract not only people to ourselves, but even beyond that, what we're going to learn is that God wants to use our lives to point people back to him in relationship. So if you've got your handouts, let me just jump to the main thought. I want to get this right out of the way, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about it. Here it is. As we enter into this last week of emotional IQ, here's the main point I want to share with you today. God is calling me to be a peacemaker. God is calling me to be a peacemaker. I want to show you just very briefly some words that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. This flows out of the Beatitudes uh, that Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus simply said these words. He said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I want you to notice the correlation between being a child of God and the call on our lives to be peacemakers. And yet I believe the truth is that many people, many Christians, don't live as peacemakers. Many Christians who claim that they know Jesus and that the relationship with God is right, their lives don't reflect that in healthy relationships where they're living at peace. Many of their human relationships are not at peace. They're broken and dysfunctional relationships. And I believe this gets back to the issue of being emotionally unhealthy. I believe God wants to do some work in our hearts to help raise our level of emotional awareness so that we are better peacemakers and have better relationships in our life. And we're going to learn today why this is so important. But I want to tell you that this call on our lives to be peacemakers, this is not, hear me clearly on this, this is not just some like additional, optional accessory to the Christian life for a few of us who choose to have good relationships with other people. This, we're going to learn today, is just absolutely foundational to the Christian life, that if our walk with God is right, it ought to be evidenced in how we are living out relationships with other people in our life. And right now, if I'll just say it, and I'm going to probably say it a couple times as we go through this today, if you find in your life, I'm not just talking about one or two strained relationships, we all have those, and, and we'll talk about that before we're done today. How do we deal with those people that are just impossible to deal with? Um, but I'm talking about if the vast majority of your human relationships are broken and dysfunctional. And right now, you think I'm talking about everybody else in your life. I might actually be talking about you. That might actually be one of the signs of just how emotionally unhealthy you are if you do not have enough emotional awareness to go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What is the common denominator in all of my broken and dysfunctional relationships? What is the one thing they all have in common? Me. What if there's something that God needs to do in my heart? What if there's some work that God would like to do in my life to bring me to this place where I'm actually a peacemaker instead of having a life just full of chaos and drama in my relationships? This is huge. I want to go to the book of 2 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles, join me there. We're going to spend the majority of our time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a passage of scripture. I'm going to be in verses like 16 down to verse 21. So rich, this text is so much that, that we could spend more than just one week dissecting what, what the Apostle Paul is saying about our relationship with God and then ultimately with other people. But I'm going to try and just kind of stop along the way and draw out some of the nuggets of straight up gold that are in this passage of scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 16, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from, look at this phrase, from a worldly point of view. 
Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And then here's just kind of a classic Bible memory verse. Chances are you've heard this before. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. My old King James roots love the, the way of saying it. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's how I learned to, to say that verse. But here's, here's a couple things I want you to notice out of this. First of all, we're talking about being a peacemaker, right? That God is calling me to be a peacemaker. The first point I want to make is that this does not come naturally or easy to any one of us. We are not born into the world hardwired to have good relationships with God or with other people. We are born into this world cut off from a holy God in a wrong relationship with him and therefore we're in wrong relationship with others. That's what Paul is talking about when he says that we no longer view this world through our old worldly lens. We no longer look at the world that way. There was a time in our life before we knew Christ that we did not have an accurate view of God and who he is and therefore, we didn't have an accurate view of others. We didn't even have an accurate view of ourself. But here's what happens. For those of us who have come to a place in our life where we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, something profound happened the day you trusted Christ as your Savior. Paul says that in that one moment that you placed your faith in Jesus, where you said, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God who came to this earth and died on a cross. You took my sin upon yourself and I am calling upon your name for salvation. I believe you are the son of God. I believe I need your work in my life to be forgiven and to be restored into a right relationship with God. On that day, something profound happened. The old you passed away. You immediately became a new creation. You entered into the family of God. You are now a child of the living God. We're going to learn that doesn't mean that everything changes immediately in your life. There is a lifelong process of the, the Bible word is sanctification, of growing day by day more and more to be Christ-like and to live out the righteousness of Christ. But here's the thing. All of a sudden, the old way we used to live, we now are alive to a new way of living. The old way is dead. It's passed away. We have a new lens for viewing God and for viewing others. So I want to take that lens in the context of being a peacemaker and dealing with conflict. I just want to break something down kind of briefly if I can. Before we came to know Christ as our Savior, we had an old way of dealing with conflict, an unhealthy way of dealing with conflict and with problems relationally. And you'll notice on your handouts, I've given you kind of a, a bullet point list of some of these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time unpacking them, but here's a few of them. We, we used to deal with conflict by avoiding it, running from it, pretending it's not there. Sometimes we deal with conflict by just shutting down. We just go all, you know, stonewall the other person. We'll give them the silent treatment. We'll just cut them out of our life. Some of us deal with conflict by holding on to grudges. And bitterness, again, remember, like, we need to learn to view bitterness like ringworm and pink eye. Like, that's gross. Nobody wants to be around a bitter person. Bitter, unforgiving people do not attract others to themselves. They repel others. It's emotionally unhealthy. And yet it's the old way that we used to deal with conflict. Some of us, we were brought up to deal with conflict by going on the offensive and attacking Oh yeah? You, you want to you wanna have conflict with me? Guess what? I'm going to attack you. Uh, that, that means physical confrontations, going back to when we were toddlers. You know, we used to go hands-on with people and physically fight them. Some of us grow out of that at an early age. Some people never do, and they make headlines in the news every single night for how they physically assaulted someone else because they never learned how to deal with conflict other than physically assaulting somebody. Most of us get a little more, um, uh, I, I can't think of the word I want to use here. We, we get a little more sophisticated. There, there's the word. So we learn to attack people with our words. It's been a long time since I've actually punched somebody in the face. I felt like it many times, but, but I've, I've controlled that urge. Instead, I attack with my words. I use my words to harm and insult. I use my words to gossip and slander and tear someone down behind their back. 
But regardless of whether it's physical assault or verbal assault, many of us in the old way of living, we deal with conflict by attacking. We, we respond to conflict by retaliating. Well, you did this to me, so I'm gonna do this to you. And, and we could keep going with that list, but what I want you to recognize is none of those are healthy, God-honoring ways for dealing with conflict. But it's how we came into this world hardwired in our old worldly view. When we viewed God wrong and we viewed others wrong and we viewed ourselves wrong, that's how we handled conflict and it's dysfunctional and it's unhealthy. But what I want you to know is like Paul said, old things have passed away. The old is done. The new has come. We have a new set of not only skills to deal with people relationally, but here's the other thing I want to say. We have a new source of power that empowers us to do relationships the right way. Because as you look at that handout, I've kind of paralleled the, the, the two ways, the worldly old way of dealing with conflict and our new way being in Christ, some skills that we have. Here's the point I want to make to that, is that first of all, um, I know people who are not believers that handle conflict in that healthier way. It is possible to not believe in Jesus and yet to follow some of those good principles for doing relationships. And here's what I want to say to that. God's truth works whether you believe in God or not. So even to non-believers, if you want to choose, you can say, I don't believe in Jesus at all. Well, guess what? You can still choose to do some of those positive things, healthy ways of dealing with conflict. And guess what? You'll get positive, healthy results in your relationship because because God's truth works whether you believe in God or not. But the difference is, for those of us who are in Christ, not only do we have a new system of dealing with conflict, we have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, helping us live out some of these things. I'm not going to drill down too deeply into these. I am going to point a few things out to you, and then this week in our connection groups, we'll spend more time talking about these practical skills in relationships. But you'll notice just, I'm giving you a couple practical examples on there of the new way that we can deal with conflict. One, you'll notice I spelled out what we've come to call in this church the four rules of communication. They come out of Ephesians chapter four. The Bible does not call them the four rules of communication. We've just kind of packaged them that way. But it's rule number one is be honest. Rule number two is keep current. That means we deal with the problem sooner rather than later. We don't just let it sit and fester. Rule number three, we attack the problem, not the person. We just talked about how we use our words and sometimes our physical bodies to attack the person instead of the problem. Rule number four is I need to be quick to forgive. And forgiveness is just a key component of how to be a peacemaker and how to deal in a healthy way with conflict in our relationships. I also put on the handouts for you to study. You remember week one of this series, I told you about this book I recommended Peter Schizero's book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And in his book, one of the chapters, he goes into this stuff that I'm listing here. He talks about the Bill of Rights, that out of respect for yourself and for other people, we, we extend these rights to them. And you can read through the list yourself, but we give them the right to space and privacy, the right to be different, the right to disagree, the right to be heard, the right to be taken seriously. And he goes into much more detailed explanation in his book. If you've waited till the end of this series to get the book, I'm going to say it one more time. Go get the book. He goes into a lot more detail that I, than I have time to unpack in, in a Sunday morning sermon. But there's some really good stuff. He goes on to talk about how we, we can check out our assumptions. Let me just pause there for a minute because I don't want to just brush past that. Think about how many conflicts happen in your relationships because you assumed something. You assumed you knew what the person meant when they said something. You assumed the worst about somebody. And, and if we just take it upon ourselves to check out our assumptions and, and, and come alongside somebody and say, hey, can I just ask you something like, you said this thing, did you really mean it that way? Because that's how I took it. See, the, see how that's a, being a peacemaker? He also talks about in his book the need to clearly communicate my expectations. Again, Think about how often we have conflict in our relationships because of our own expectations that we place on other people. Sometimes they're okay expectations. Other times they're not even fair 
or realistic. We have expectations of our wife, our husband, our kids, our boss, our friends. And if we don't clearly communicate those expectations, and yet then we find ourselves mad because someone failed to live up to an expectation we quietly, secretively held, we're not being peacemakers. And emotionally healthy people learn how to do this in their relationship, how to clearly communicate, hey, here's what I expect. Here's something that I really need from you in our relationship. And then we work through whether or not that's a realistic and a healthy expectation to place on someone else. He also talks about, and I don't have the time to unpack all of this, but he talks about being aware of my emotional allergies and triggers. And he does a really good job of explaining how sometimes in our current relationships, somebody can do something that just sets us off and has really nothing to do with that person. It takes us back to a trigger point earlier in our life, to a point of pain and woundedness that really doesn't have anything to do with this person. And being emotionally healthy, we're aware of that. We can identify, look, my problem really isn't with this guy. My problem's with this pain and this hurt from my past. And I'm, I'm aware of what sets me off emotionally. It's, it's this idea of having a high emotional IQ and an emotional self-awareness. Again, this is just a sample of some of the practical tools that we have at our disposal as peacemakers, as children of God who've been given a new way of handling life. But I want to keep moving in this text because there's other great stuff I want to get to. I want to ask the question, how do we get this new nature how is, is the message, well, you just got to try really hard to do everything on this list. No, the Apostle Paul is getting ready to tell us the very next verse. Verse 18 says this, all this is from who? It's from God. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, look at this phrase, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Man, there's some good stuff going on in this text, and I want to show it to you. First of all, notice where Paul says that this is from God. So we're talking about being peacemakers, right? This is not optional. I said that earlier. This is God's command on our lives as his followers, as his children. You have to be about this ministry of reconciliation. I am about this ministry of reconciling the world to myself, and as my child, you have to join me in that. It's not optional. To not be a peacemaker as a Christian is to live in disobedience to God's will for our lives. It's just that simple. Something else I want you to see from this text is that This ministry of reconciliation has its foundation in the very gospel message itself. The reason that you and I can even live peacefully in our relationships with other people is because God moved first on our behalf. If you want, on your notes, you could just jot down the the scripture reference, Romans 5, 8, that says, but God demonstrates his love toward us in this While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The message of the gospel is that God initiated this ministry of reconciliation with us. We were the ones in the wrong, not him. We had sinned against him. We had offended him. He he did not do anything wrong toward us, and yet he took the first step towards us. He left his splendor and glory of heaven to come and be born in this earth to live among sinful mankind, ultimately to lay down his life on a cross in the most unbelievable, excruciating way of dying. He died a death of crucifixion on the cross of Calvary. He went first on behalf of us. That's the message of the gospel. And now he's telling those of us who have been forgiven and bought back by the precious blood of Jesus, he's telling us, you now get to join me in my ministry of reconciliation. I want to use your life, not only to make peace with other people, I don't only want you to live at peace with others, I want your life to point others back to me so that they can also live in peace with me. Because I am about the ministry of reconciling the world to myself. Can you see, by the way, the word that just is popping into my mind right now is the word hypocrisy. 
Can you see the hypocrisy that we as Christians live out for the rest of the world when we claim to know and love God and be right with God and yet our lives are full of dysfunctional relationships? The world looks at that and goes, you're nothing but a hypocrite because it obviously doesn't work in your life. Can you see why God is wanting us to live these attractive lives of being peacemakers in our relationships? It's what he's after. By the way, you'll notice going back to that column on the right of your handouts where I'm talking about the new ways we have of dealing with conflict. And when I'm spelling out the rules of communication, the four rules of communication, rule number one is be honest, right? You'll notice I've given you two scripture references alongside of that. They both come from Matthew. One is Matthew chapter 5, and one is in Matthew chapter 18, I think. You can look it up yourself. But either way, what you're going to find is that Jesus is speaking in both of those passages, and what he's telling us is this. In one, he says, if your brother has sinned against you, go and show him his fault, just the two of you so that you can be reconciled to your brother. In the other one, Jesus says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has an offense against you. Leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother. Do you see this goal that Jesus has in our physical relationships, our human relationships, the ministry of reconciliation? Whether you're mad at someone else or whether you know that they're mad at you, either way, Jesus is saying it's on you. Go to them and be reconciled. Take the first step. Be an initiator. That is what peacemaking is all about. It's initiating the steps of conflict resolution. By the way, I want to clear up this myth because some of you were brought up in homes that you were taught this. And the myth, the lie, says that in order to be a peacemaker, I need to avoid conflict. Well, I just want to live at peace with everyone in my life, so I'm not going to have conflict with anybody. But the truth is, and maybe you want to write this down on your notes, the truth is that avoiding conflict is false peacemaking. Running away from conflict, avoiding conflict, is not making peace at all. It is false peacemaking. It is not what Jesus did. Jesus took the conflict head on. He came to this earth, was born into sinful humanity, took on the cloak of our humanness and lived among us and faced the death on the cross of Calvary head on. He did not avoid conflict. He hit it head on. And if you study the life of Jesus, we mentioned this earlier in the series, the life of Jesus was full of conflict and yet he was one of the most emotionally healthy human beings there ever was because he was God and man and he was perfect and yet he had conflict in many of his relationships, but guess what? It was healthy conflict. Conflict is healthy if we deal with it appropriately. Some of you today have been running from conflict in your life. One of the healthiest things you could do would be to stop running from it and hit it head on in a healthy way. Just let that one sink in for a minute because I know what you're experiencing because I've experienced it many times in my life. It's that pit you get in your stomach. It's the the sweaty palms and the increased heart rate at even the thought of going and sitting down with that family member, with that friend, with that brother or sister in Christ, saying we need to have a conversation. It takes boldness. It takes gentleness. It takes a love for the other person. The, the most loving thing you can do when you love somebody and there's, there's a problem is to con- confront it. The most unloving thing you can do is run away from it. Can I just tell you as your pastor, it is one of the things that breaks my heart the most about ministry. It is one of the heaviest things that I deal with in ministry and I know I'm not alone in this. It's not if there's conflict in the church, it's only a matter of when And I'm here to tell you, after 12 and a half years of being the pastor of the Rescue Church, we have had all kinds of conflict in our church. And I'm telling you, the hardest thing for me, the heaviest thing for me, is when God's people, instead of dealing honestly with conflict and doing it in a healthy way, when they run from it. And and what does that look like? It looks like they just quit coming to church. And they don't tell me, they don't communicate with me, they tell someone else, we're just not coming back. It breaks my heart. It sucks. 
That is not the loving thing to do, to just walk away from your church family and your spiritual leaders who have prayed for you, who have invested into you, who have poured their hearts and lives into yours, then to just have something come up and go, well, we're just walking away. That's cowardly. That's unloving. That is not healthy, and that is not being a peacemaker. And I just want to tell you, as your pastor to the Rescue Church, you have my word. I will not treat you that way. If there's conflict, if there's a problem, you have my word. I will be a peacemaker, and I will play through that discomfort of coming to you and sitting down and saying, can we have a conversation? This is going to be awkward. This is going to be painful, but I love you enough to deal with this head on. That's what Jesus did for us. Avoiding conflict is not loving. It's not healthy. It's not peacemaking. Hitting it head on in a loving, healthy, emotionally secure way is the tools that Christ has given us to do this right and to live lives that are attractive where other people go, man, I want to be in his circle. I want to be in her circle of relationships. They're healthy, and I'm drawn to that. Well, let's keep going here. Next verse, verse 20 says this. Paul writes, we are therefore Christ's, look at this word, this is huge. We are Christ's ambassadors. I'll come back to that. As though God were making his appeal through us, We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's where it starts. Be reconciled in your relationship to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, there's so much good stuff happening in this passage. I want to go back to that word ambassador. Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. What does that even mean? To be an ambassador for somebody is to represent the one who sent you. You are there acting on their behalf. And what the Bible is telling us is this. Those of us who are children of God, we are in this world representing the one who sent us. We are his ambassadors to others around us to be involved in the ministry of reconciling them back to a right relationship with God. That is the heart of the gospel message. God loves us. We are not in right relationship with him. He initiates the first move so that we can be restored. And now, once we're back in right relationship with him, he's saying, if my relationship with you is right, I want your relationship with others to be right because you represent me to a lost world that is in desperate need of a savior. What an awesome responsibility that is. And again, what hypocrisy the world sees when God's ambassadors, instead of showing others a way to be reconciled in their relationships to God and to one another, through our lives and through our dysfunction, we show the world that all of our talk about a right relationship with God doesn't seem to have the ability to penetrate our relationships with our wife, with our husband, with our kids, with our church family, with our neighbors, It doesn't work. And instead of them seeing ambassadors representing Christ well, they see hypocrites who are emotionally unhealthy, who claim to be spiritually mature. Do you see the disconnect here? Another way of saying this is is if, if I'm reconciled to God, it is impossible for me to be at hatred and odds with other people. It's not saying I'm never gonna have conflict, but what it's saying is this, it's impossible to love God and hate my fellow man. It's impossible to be in a right relationship with God and to be in constant, dysfunctional, chaotic relationships with other people. I said this before, and I'm going to say it again, then I'm going to show you just two more scriptures and I'll be done. I just got to drive this point home because like, the whole series has been building to this right here. I believe one of our tendencies when we hear God's word preached is to say, John, that is a great message. I hope this guy sitting next to me is listening. As a matter of fact, I always tell this story about years ago in the church that kind of sent me out into ministry where I kind of learned to to preach and stuff when I used to get opportunities to preach. I had this one old grumpy guy, and I'm calling him old because he was, and I'm calling him grumpy because he was. This old grumpy guy that would sit in the back of church, and when I would get done preaching, he'd come up to me with a big scowl on his face and say, John, that was a great message, but I want you to know the people who needed it most weren't listening. I was watching them. 
And it's like, what if that message was actually for you? The point is this, when we are not emotionally healthy, we lack emotional self-awareness, and we think when God's word is being preached, it's being preached for other people, when in fact God is wanting it to be for us. So I'm gonna say this again. If your life is so full of drama and conflict and broken dysfunctional relationships, what if the problem isn't all those other people? What if the sickness and the problem lies within your own heart? I'll tell you what, as I continue to grow in my relationship with God and in my relationship with others, going back to my early analogy about kind of avoiding unhealthy people, I, I've just found that I have a, a just low tolerance, a very low threshold for people whose lives are just continually full of chaos and drama. I'm not saying I won't be kind to you. I'm not saying I won't extend the love of Christ to you, but I'm saying this. This is just part of me being emotionally healthy and guarding my heart. I hold those kind of sick people at arm's length. If you are someone who thrives on drama, you will not be close to me because I choose to put people around me in my inner circle who are relationally healthy, who are emotionally healthy. I am not drawn to emotionally sick people. I am drawn to emotionally healthy people and I wanna be one of those. I wanna be life-giving in my relationships to other people. And so I'm just telling you, if some of you, if, you just, if your life thrives on moving from one drama to the next to the next, Either you need to start setting some healthy boundaries in your life where you tell these people, they might be your family, they might be your friends, listen, I love you, but you can come this far and you can come no farther. I am not gonna keep stepping back into your drama. But listen, if there's something about your life that you are just drawn to their drama and the circus of it all, you might be more of a clown than you realize. And I'm trying to say that lovingly and gently, and you're probably mad at me right now, but I'm just saying, if there's something in you that is drawn to that dysfunction and that chaos, friends, the problem is not with all those other people. The problem is in here. And so here's what God's word would say to us. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You hear me say this on a regular basis from this stage, that if you claim that your relationship with God is right, i.e. you claim spiritual maturity, then it ought to be evidenced in how you do relationships with other people, i.e. emotional health. To claim this one and not have this one, John says we're liars, we're hypocrites, we're bad ambassadors for the kingdom. When we tell the world this relationship's right, but I can't do human relationships very well. Let me end on a little bit more of a fair note because some of you might be feeling like, oh my gosh, I've got some cut off broken relationships in my life, and John just called me a clown. <laughs> What's up with that? Hey, I want to just end on one, one verse that I think just speaks a ton of peace and a ton of hope into this, but you're going to see the word peace right in there, okay? Romans 12, 18. Anytime I'm dealing with people in relationships, here's, here's a verse that I reach for. Romans 12, 18 says this. If it is possible, and I love that phrase because the word if implies that it might not be possible. If it is possible, and then look at this next phrase, it puts all the responsibility where it needs to be. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. You can't control what other people do. You can't control how other people react. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's God's will for our lives. That's God's desire for us as his ambassadors is to be peacemakers in our relationships. So what do you do when, when you have a relationship that they're not willing to be peacemakers? They're not willing to deal with conflict in a healthy way. As much as it depends on you, if it is possible. So what that means, I believe, practically speaking, is you do everything in your power to live at peace with others. But then there comes a point where you have to wash your hands of a situation and say, the ball is in your court. 
I am remaining reconcilable. If you want to come to the table and we want to have an honest, healthy discussion, I'm available for that. And if you don't want to do it today, you come back in 12 months, I will make myself available. I will be in a posture of forgiveness. I will be in a posture of humility. I will be in a posture of peacemaking. Because that's I can control all of that. As far as it depends on me, I'm willing to be at peace in this relationship. But there may be others that just are not willing. We've experienced this just in the last, well, week and, and several months in the life of our church in regards to closing our Slayton campus. There were some personal offenses that took place. And as the leadership of this church, this is the posture we're taking. As far as it depends on us, we are ready to come to the table and resolve unresolved conflict and bring closure to that. If the others aren't willing, then we can't can't affect that. We're willing and we will be peacemakers because that's what God has called us to. My question for you today is who is it in your life that you need to make peace with? What relationship is God calling you to be a peacemaker? And what boundary is God saying, I need you to set this boundary in your life so that you can be healthy because I want you to be an attractive lifestyle to others. I want people to be attracted to your emotional health. I do not want my children being repelled by your sickness. My prayer for you is that you will take this message to heart and apply it to your life this week and that God would do incredible things in the relationships of the people of this church as we join him in his ministry of reconciliation. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer today. Father, I thank you so much for this time that you've given to me, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power that you've given us to live out our relationships in a new way. The old sinful way that we used to handle conflict, it's dead and gone if we choose to embrace that. Sometimes, because we still sin, we go back to that old way of dealing with conflict But God, I thank you that you've set us free from that if we choose to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit, to choose to resolve conflict in a healthy way, to be emotionally healthy, attractive people who are doing our relationships with others so well that we're pointing them ultimately back to you in order that they can be reconciled to you. God in heaven, I pray if there's someone in the sound of my voice who up to this point in their life has never been reconciled to you, by trusting in the name of Jesus Christ for their personal salvation from sin, I pray that today would be their day of salvation where they would call upon you. And Lord, I know in the Rescue Church there are many of us who call you our Lord and Savior. We, we claim to belong to your family. My prayer is that as much as we claim that, it would be evident in how we do our relationships with other people, that we, we would be men and women with healthy relationships in our lives, that we would join you in reconciling a lost world back to you. God, please use this message in our hearts in any way that you see fit and continue to build emotionally healthy people in the life of this church. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.